My name's Brandon and this is Cartoon Network Video Game History, a show where I take a look back on all of the video games based on Cartoon Network franchises and retrospectively review them. There are some mixed emotions as I come to the final ever Code Lyoko game. On one hand, I'm excited to be finally done with this series, but on the other hand, I'm dreading having to review yet another Code Lyoko game. This week, we jump back to the Nintendo DS after a brief stop on consoles for Code Lyoko Quest for Infinity. Code Lyoko Fall of Xana was exclusive to the Nintendo DS and released to audiences in June of 2008. They really milked this franchise because this was the third Code Lyoko game released within 13 months. Nico Entertainment returned for this follow-up after taking the development reins for Quest for Infinity. That game was clearly heavily reliant on the style set by DC Studios in the first game, so this is their first real chance to put their mark on the series. As all the Code Lyoko games were, this release was published by The Game Factory, where fun is allegedly made. As you could predict if you've seen my other two videos on the Code Lyoko games, Fall of Xana was received poorly by critics. It sits at a 51 on Metacritic, making it the worst game in the trilogy. IGN gave it a 5.5, and GameSpot gave it a 4.5. So, let's get this over and done with. It's time to virtualize one last time to review Code Lyoko Fall of Xana. As I mentioned in my Quest for Infinity review, both this game and Quest for Infinity cover the exact same time periods in the show. They both cover the main story beats of Season 4, but the big difference is that since all of Season 4 had been released, now the developers were able to provide a more cohesive adaptation. Quite literally, the only major story difference I noticed between the two games is that Fall of Xana has the Colossus present as a boss character. Outside of that, it seemed like the stories for both games were identical. Maybe if you're a diehard Code Lyoko fan, you'd be able to spot the differences more easily and appreciate the story, but to a relative outsider, it all seemed the same. You're still trying to free William, still going through the same environments, and still doing the same repetitive bullshit. Heck, you even face off against multiple bosses that you already faced off against in Quest for Infinity. There is honestly no reason why this game needed to exist as a standalone thing. You could have just ported Quest for Infinity to the DS and nobody would have batted an eyelid for a second. I have no idea how well these games sold, but I can't see how it would have made financial sense to make a whole new game from scratch. Speaking of rehashing things, almost the entire soundtrack consists of heavily compressed versions of the music in Quest for Infinity. If you've ever wanted to listen to heavily compressed versions of unremarkable songs, this is the game for you. Another thing brought over from Quest for Infinity is the unorthodox main menu setup. This time you at least have a save select screen before being thrust into it, but once you're in, it's essentially the same. You can scroll through a few different Caddick locations, chat to characters, and then launch into a new mission. How well does the gameplay though? That's the big question. Well, it certainly has all the hallmarks of a typical RPG. Leveling up, stats, wild encounters, healing and battle items, basically anything you'd expect to see in an RPG, you'll find here. Something that surprised me is that this game is entirely played through the touchscreen. Before playing, I'd read that Nico wanted to take advantage of the touchscreen more than Get Ready to Virtualize did, and I guess they achieved that here. You move around the overworld by dragging the stylus around, and like pretty much every RPG to grace a DS, all of the battling and menus can be done via the touchscreen. This honestly works rather well, and allows for quick movement between menus and quick selection of moves during battles. Speaking of, the battle mechanics and gameplay are what make or break a game like this. Unfortunately, despite me being initially intrigued by a Code Lyoko RPG, it completely let me down. Fall of Xana goes for real-time battles here, and it fails spectacularly. For the majority of the game, you'll have Odd, Ulrich, Aelita, and Yumi in your party. Once a battle starts, for every character in your party, you'll be able to either select a regular attack, a more powerful attack that drains an MP meter, a super move that uses a separate meter, or an item. After making any of your moves, your character will then go into a cooldown phase where they're unable to do anything. This cooldown phase is probably my biggest issue with the battles. Even with four different characters, waiting for your next attack is tediously long. If you thought the battles played out slow in Pokemon Diamond and Pearl, you've never played this game. The enemies also have a similar cooldown time too, which adds to the amount of dead air that's in battles. 99% of battles will play out for you using all four of your attacks, your enemies using all of their attacks, and then everybody just standing around doing nothing for 30 seconds. This mightn't be too bad for a shorter game, but for a game that takes like 5 plus hours to beat, it's an absolute slog to get through. The waiting around in battles becomes unbearable when you have less than 4 party members. At one point in the game, Odd and Yumi are unavailable, so you just play through battles as Ulrich and Aelita, which takes forever. The game already moved at the speed of Crawl, but during this period it felt like the game was going backwards. At points in some battles, yet another meter might be filled. This game just loves its goddamn meters. This one is called Tension, and once filled it allows you to use a superpowered version of your regular moves, with the particular strength of the attack being based on how well you perform in a dinky little minigame. Honestly, I found these Tension moves annoying. 
If you mess up the minigame, you'll do significantly less damage than your regular attacks, and there's no way to just ignore it and use a non-tension attack once the meter is filled. Another huge issue is that the game teaches you literally nothing about its battle system. They throw you in there and give you not a hint of what's going on. For a series like Pokemon, this is okay because it's straightforward. You literally just have to select a move. Here it's much more complicated, with an array of different meters and different categories of attacks. Some sort of tutorial would have been nice, because I was about halfway through the game before I figured out what the FP bar did. There are also just a lot of fundamental issues about the battling. Because of the nature of this game's battle style and the fact that you're facing multiple enemies at once 99% of the time, it never makes any sense to use anything other than moves that damage multiple enemies at once. Considering you rarely face off against one enemy, you end up spamming the exact same attacks over and over again. Similarly, I'm still unaware as to if certain enemies are weak or strong against different types of attacks. At times, certain attacks seem to be weak against various enemies, but there was literally no in-game indication to whether this was true or not. This again resulted in me just spamming the same overall strongest attacks. As is the case in every RPG ever, after a battle is completed, you gain experience and an item or three. Despite gaining experience, it never actually feels like your characters are growing stronger. Not only does every character in your party grow at virtually the same pace, but the enemies scale so well with your party that you never get that awesome feeling of increased power. It'll take you the same amount of time to defeat enemies the entire way through the campaign, which just feels wrong and makes the leveling up pointless. The only aspect of the gameplay that gives your characters a chance to feel stronger are the special plug-in item pickups. There are various items scattered throughout the world that will bump up things like the attack and defense of a character or make them slowly recharge the meter that allows them to use special moves. These items are few and far between, and while they provide a little boost, it's nothing significant. As I mentioned earlier when talking about various parts of Quest for Infinity that this game lifted, there are a few boss battles scattered throughout. These are laughably easy, and in many cases will be over quicker than a regular battle. These battles are always 4 on 1, meaning you have the distinct advantage. You would have thought they'd beef up the boss monster's stats, but they really didn't. Every boss encounter will involve you spamming the strongest moves in the game without repercussions and then quickly bringing it to its knees. And finally, as is the custom in a Code Lyoko game, you face off against the same 3 or 4 enemies for the entire game. Graphically, the game isn't the worst thing I've seen on the Nintendo DS. They went for a chibi overworld style here, which definitely helped a lot. I don't think I have a whole lot to gripe about here. However, my biggest gripe about this game is its saving and checkpointing system. Save points are sparsely littered around levels, and if you die, these act as a checkpoint. Unfortunately, rather than being an actual checkpoint, it just reloads your save, meaning all of your stats and health are the same as when you saved. This might not seem like an issue on the surface, but it actually is a massive problem. If you save at a checkpoint with low health, and then eventually die, you are fucked. You're almost guaranteed to be stuck in an infinite death loop if this happens to you. In one level, I actually did have this happen to me. I decided I'd try to tough it out, after all the game does give out items after battles, and sometimes these restore your health. After inching my way through half a dozen battles against singular monsters, I came up to a battle against five monsters and immediately knew I was stuck for good. I'd like to note that in those dozen or so battles I won, the game did not give me a single health pickup. In the majority of battles before I was stuck, and in the majority of battles afterwards, I would get a health pickup like 90% of the time. This might be me getting all tinfoil hat, but it honestly felt like the game was deliberately withholding them from me. The game's solution for this is to de-virtualize and restart the mission from scratch. No fucking thank you. Missions can take like an hour to complete at times, so forcing players to play through all that again is actually insane. I ended up resorting to using cheats. Nico Entertainment were out of their minds if they thought I was ever going to replay through all that nonsense. William de Código Lyoko. Cuidado, está poseído por Shara. Maneja su enorme espada y lucha con la manta negra por los cuatro sectores. Ahora puedes tener a William. A William y la manta negra o a William y los cuatro sectores. No seas malo. Solo en Toys R Us. Code Lyoko Fall of Xana might just be the most boring and dull game I have ever played in my life. The battle system had loads of potential, but they ended up making something void of any enjoyment. Sitting around for 30 seconds twiddling your thumbs every battle is not enjoyable. The way it was all laid out honestly just sent me into autopilot mode. Halfway through this game, I was so bored out of my mind, I decided to throw on some podcasts just so I didn't lose my mind. An RPG version of Code Lyoko is a really intriguing idea, but after playing this, I would have preferred another subpar hack and slash game like the first two entries. I think Metacritic got this one correct. Fall of Xana is the worst Code Lyoko game. And with that said, we are finally done with all the Code Lyoko games. Thank God for that. Not only were they awful to play through, but the Code Lyoko reviews have the lowest views by far since I returned, proving that nobody gives a fuck about this show. 
Next week, we'll be back to our regularly scheduled programming, this time reviewing Ben 10 Alien Force. I hope you all like Ben 10, because four of the next five reviews feature that little alien bastard.